Bien, rebonjour à toutes et à tous. Eh bien, c'est un grand plaisir d'accueillir avec nous aujourd'hui Jean-Philippe Brantu. Jean-Philippe Brantu est professeur sur la chaire Sandoz, je crois, à l'EPFL depuis déjà six ans, 2016. Alors Jean-Philippe, c'est quelqu'un qui est bien connu ici puisqu'il a fait sa thèse à Palaiso dans le groupe d'optique quantique. Il me disait qu'en fait, il avait fait le déménagement de, de Orsay à Palaiso. Donc c'était vraiment... Le, il a fait partie de ceux qui ont essuyé les plâtres au sens propre et au sens figuré de, 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 du bâtiment de Palaiso. Euh, il a fait sa thèse, donc oui, dans le groupe d'Alain Aspect avec Philippe Bouillet. La thèse de, de Jean-Philippe était vraiment très jolie. C'était euh, plein de choses qu'on pouvait faire avec les pièges dipolaires. Et moi, je me souviens en particulier de ce trampoline atomique qui était très joli. On voyait les atomes qui rebondissaient sur un, sur un, sur un miroir fait avec des, des, une onde stationnaire. C'était très, très, très belle manip. Euh, tu avais aussi, je crois, tu avais fait les premiers pas dans le propagation en présence de désordre à deux dimensions, qui était aussi quelque chose de très joli. Euh, ensuite, Jean-Philippe est allé chez Tillman et Slinger, d'abord comme postdoc, Marie Curie, et puis après comme, je ne sais pas quel était le titre officiel, Research Assistant peut-être, quelque chose comme ça. Oui, je... Over Assistant. Over Assistant. <rire> <rire> euh, et là, il y a eu aussi une cascade de résultats vraiment très spectaculaires qui a concerné tout ce qui était conduction. De, de, de fermions dans des canaux, euh, quantification de la conductance, euh, il y a eu des expériences faites avec des points quantiques qui étaient mis et qui étudiaient comment se comportait donc, le, le, le flux à travers ce point, le point quantique. Donc c'est des très belles manip. Et donc depuis 2016, il a pris ce poste à l'EPFL et euh, un de ses thèmes de recherche, ce dont il va nous parler aujourd'hui, c'est encore des très jolies expériences. C'est un un gaz de fermi en interaction forte couplé à une cavité fortement. Donc ça fait deux fois fort. Voilà. Et donc, je... merci beaucoup, Jean-Philippe, d'être venu jusqu'à nous pour, pour nous présenter ça. OK. Um, so, I'm going to speak English, uh, following the recommendations of Jean, but uh, of course, feel free to ask questions in French. Uh, I will also answer in French in this case. So. Uh, thanks a lot for the, uh, the introduction. It's a bit intimidating, I should say, uh, to talk after the lecture and, and after such a kind introduction. Um, it's, it's actually doubly intimidating in a sense because I'm, I'm also going to talk about uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics experiments. And this place is, 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 of course, special in this respect. And, and probably several of you know this topic much better uh, than I do. So. Uh, That, that is a bit of uh, also kind of an imposter syndrome that I kind of feel here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so uh, as, as Jean explained, I'm going to tell you about the experiments which we've been doing at EPFL over the last few years, uh, which deal with uh, ultra cold Fermi gases that we trap in uh, a high finesse cavity. And I'm going to tell you the few surprises you get uh, out of the interplay of the interaction between atoms and interactions of these atoms with light. So uh, before coming to, to the topic, I'd like to introduce the people who actually do the job uh, in the lab. And I'm mostly going to talk about this particular experiment, about uh, Fermi gases. <coughs> But uh, yes, mo most and uh, actually all the results have actually been, been taken by, by these people. Uh, and Kevin and Hideki have actually left the group. But I want to uh, also credit them for the, uh, the results I'm going to present. So I'm, I will suppose that you are a bit more familiar with ultra-cold atoms than perhaps with cavity QEDs. Uh, and I'm going to uh, introduce very, very briefly uh, what we mean by this and why uh, this can be considered interesting. And I should apologize for the people who can tell these things uh, while they sleep, essentially. So if you uh, consider an atom, uh, say, ground and excited state, a two-level atom, and you place it inside the cavity, you drive the cavity and uh, put photons in. Once the photon is in, and if the frequency of the photon matches that of the transition, uh, the photon can be absorbed uh, by the atom uh, and back, and this process and, and re-emitted back in the cavity mode. This process can be coherent, and the rate at which this happens is the Hobby frequency uh, of the uh, light matter coupling strength. This is very simple, and that, that it stays coherent as long as other dissipation processes um, are small or negligible. And there are different kinds of dissipation processes. The first one is that the atom might emit the photon not in the mode of the cavity, but somewhere else. Um, and the second process is that once the photon is in the cavity, it can actually come out. Uh, 
So these are the two main processes which compete uh, with the coherent exchange of energy between atom uh, and light. And <clears throat> the figure of merit, the dimensionless figure of merit, which quantifies whether this process is coherent or not, is called the cooperativity. Uh, this is a dimensionless uh, parameter which will tell you whether the light is strongly or weakly coupled to the atom. Um, so this is something, uh, this is the, the main player of, of the talk uh, that I'm, uh, uh, for everything that I'm going to tell you about later. Uh, just one comment here, uh, this, uh, uh, so the, the likelihood that an excited atom emits light in the cavity mode as opposed to the uh, uh, free space, um, that's quantified by this has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's a purely classical process. Um, nevertheless, uh, this number is what enters with pretty much all the quantum information protocols by which you try, for example, to entangle matter with light or this kind of things. Right? So it's, it's extremely important. Uh, and actually, uh, of course, I should refer to uh, the, re the, the if, if you are interested, uh, please have a look at this book. Uh, of course, you will have, uh, have everything that you need to know about the process. And I should uh, also, uh, um, I want to mention this paper here by the Vuletic group, uh, which very nicely explains the, the classical origin as, as purely from uh, the interference of the light that's emitted by the atom and the light that's reflected by the mirrors. This is uh, extremely nice and pedagogical if, if you want to know more. So. Um, when the cooperativity is high enough, you can uh, do very simple transmission spectroscopy experiments. And you see that this is a, a very simple simulation that, uh, that one can do. Uh, and with large cooperativities, what you observe is that as opposed to having a single transmission peak when light is resonant with the cavity, um, the spectrum features two uh, modes, uh, which are splitted here by the hobby frequency. Uh, and this normal mode splitting uh, um, is something which, uh, which can be used to characterize whether the light, the light matter coupling is strong or, or weak. And here, um, um, these two modes that, we, that appear here are usually called polaritons, and they represent the dressed state, uh, which, which mix uh, light uh, excitations and, and matter uh, <laughs> excitations. Um, I should say, by the way, that, of course, th this, this is classical as long as one photon in the cavity is not able to saturate this transition, of course. Huh? I mean, which is going to be the case for everything I'm going to tell you about. But, of course, I mean, uh, there's much more to cavity QED than, than what I'm, I'm telling here. Uh, again, uh, the experts are probably in this room anyway, so uh, I'm not going to uh, say more. So uh, this, this process here is extremely general. So as long as you put light emitters in the cavity, you can try to observe uh, and most likely succeed uh, to, to observe these kind of features. I um, would like to organize the, this landscape uh, along these two different axes. Uh, so <clears throat> one axis here is the strength of light matter coupling. Uh, and if you use single emitters, um, um, you can go to extremely large coupling strengths. Uh, of course, uh, I refer again to this very famous experiment that ha have been done here over the last 20 years. And, uh, but you have many systems that can actually reach very strong light matter coupling, uh, of course, in the superconducting uh, uh, circuits, in the microwave domain, but also in the optical domain, not only with atoms, but now with semiconductor uh, nanostructures. And this is by no means an exhaustive picture, so this is just a few uh, chosen examples. Now, um, what my field of research is, is quantum simulation, uh, and for that we would like to investigate many body systems. So many body system means uh, we would like to, to start to have first many particles and then hopefully go to uh, larger and larger interactions. So going to many particles is something uh, for which uh, uh, a key step has been achieved in, uh, about 15 years ago with the coupling not of one atom, but n exactly identical atom to the field of the cavity. And that was the production of Bose-Einstein condensate, which has achieved uh, in particular at ENS, uh, but also at ETH Zurich. This is now, uh, there are now many groups uh, working with these Bose condensates inside high finest cavities. Uh, so this is uh, sort of uh, going in this direction. If one goes now this way, um, there are now examples of systems that are extremely strongly correlated. Uh, I want to point out in particular this example. It's a high TC superconductor that's studied by the group of Thomas Ebesen in Strasbourg, um, in which uh, this material was placed uh, in the vicinity of a, a plasmonic resonance. 
so close to a gold, uh, gold mirror, and it was observed uh, that the critical temperature changes out of the coupling um, of this material with light. I'm not sure this is completely understood. For sure, this is ongoing research in this field, and this is something which is uh, extremely interesting. I should also mention uh, a large amount of activity that is taking place using two-dimensional materials of different kinds. Uh, and I've seen that uh, you will have Atachi Mamoglu in a few weeks uh, here presenting. Uh, he's one of the best experts of this topic, so I'm also not going to uh, enter the details. But this, this landscape is very rich, and there's all kinds of systems uh, which, uh, which one can couple with light and, and hopefully um, observe new uh, physical phenomena. With ultra-gold atoms, we're able also to produce strongly interacting systems. Uh, in particular, about five years ago, a MOT insulator of atoms has been produced also in high finesse cavities, showing the strong coupling regime. Uh, and uh, in this uh, area, I should also mention the large amount of theory activities. I only talked about experiments, but there are many, many proposals uh, that, that um, suggest ways uh, by which the light matter interaction can be used uh, to further uh, control this, this, uh, these systems. Uh, so the, the system I'd be interested in the rest of this talk is the unitary Fermi gas. So you can think of this as essentially going as far away as possible along this axis and reaching interaction strengths for atom-atom interaction that is as large as permitted by quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is the system which we'd like to place uh, in the cavity. And as I will show you, um, there are a few surprises which show up. Uh, because these systems, due to the fact that they are strongly interacting, they actually interact with light also in a slightly different way. So this is uh, the outline of my talk. So I'm first going to tell you how this is exactly done. And I will not enter into a lot of experimental details, but I will show you basically how we characterize these systems. And then I'm going to show you two examples by which this atom-atom uh, interaction plays together with the light matter coupling. Uh, which is the observation of pair polaritons and um, some studies of the optomechanical response, which are two ways by which the interactions of atoms show up in the light uh, uh, spectroscopy. And then the last topic is uh, ongoing research in, in, in the lab for now uh, a few months. And we think we can now not only use the cavity to uh, measure how the atoms interact with each other, but to really change the state of matter and have a new, phases, uh, that, new phases that show up out of the coupling with light. And this is, uh, I, I will show you some preliminary uh, results which we have obtained, but that's something we are excited about, and you might have some questions or comments that uh, uh, would be useful at that stage. So let's start. Um, so the first thing uh, one, one, one should uh, clarify is what happens if you have, instead of one atom, many atoms. I showed you this super simplistic picture before. Uh, the first thing which happens if you have many emitters in the cavity is that the cooperativity is scaled by the number of emitters. Uh, and that is simply uh, at least if the emitters are identical. And that comes from the fact that um, these emitters, they are in the cavity. They are driven by the same cavity mode. So they are like, like uh, oscillating dipoles. So the field that's radiated is, is coherent because all the emitters are driven in a coherent way. And because of this, it interferes constructively, and you get uh, a much larger emission in the cavity mode than you would have if the emitter was alone. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that increases the cooperativity by a factor of n. The price you pay for that is that all the nonlinearities you might have with a single atom are washed away. But this is not something we'll be concerned about uh, uh, in this presentation. Um, this is completely general. You have it regardless of the quantum state of the system you're putting in. They might be thermal, bosons, fermions, uh, whatever. Um, this is just a purely uh, a classical electrodynamics effect. Actually, in the lab, how do we place these atoms? And I wanted to show this picture. So this is the lab about uh, five and a half years ago. Uh, and and uh, now it looks uh, slightly more uh, like this. And I want to show this because um, I want to credit again the PhD students and postdocs who have done the job. Anybody who has set up or tried to set up a cold atom experiment knows uh, how hard it is. And so I'm going to sweep nicely over like three and a half years of work to turn this into that. Uh, but uh, so um, yeah, I, I want to really say that um, I had an amazing team to, to do this work. And I still have an amazing team now, and they are the people who actually deal with this beast. 
So if you were to look here inside, you would see a vacuum chamber, and inside this vacuum chamber, so that's now a, an artist's view of it, uh, you would have here at the center the cavity. So these are the two mirrors of the cavity that are placed inside the, uh, the vacuum uh, system. These are the numbers for the optical cavity, that's for, uh, for the expert. The finesse is uh, something like 47,000. So there are four centimeters here uh, between the two, which allows us to do all the preparation of the cloud in between the two mirrors. So with laser cooling, evaporative cooling, and so on. Uh, this all takes place here, uh, which gives us a very nice uh, an efficient uh, uh, way of product producing the, uh, the clouds. Uh, it's also pretty fast. We have duty cycles of a few seconds only. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, there's this technical paper which contains all the details about the experiment. So this is the, uh, the cavity as it is. Um, and in, in between here, we prepare uh, clouds of lithium-6 atoms uh, with strong interactions. Uh, that, that we produce using the fishback resonance. Um, the numbers is that we have roughly half a million lithium-6 atoms, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more, depending on, on the status of the experiment, and we cool them down to temperatures of the order of 0.1 times the Fermi temperature. There again, it depends well, um, exactly on the details uh, of, of uh, um, how we perform the evaporation and which interaction strength we are using. Uh, and you see here uh, the condensation of fermion pairs, uh, which is a manifestation of the fact that at sufficiently low temperature, these uh, interacting fermions uh, um, simply become superfluid by, by Cooper pairing. So um, this is uh, the, the system which we are coupling with light. And now I'm going to um, um, do the experiments basically that I described above schematically. That is, we, we just send light onto the system and see uh, the transmission spectrum. In order to understand the transmission spectrum, uh, one needs to know a bit more details about how my, uh, the system actually looks like. I show you here the energy levels of lithium in a strong magnetic field. Uh, so we have here the relevant energy levels. So uh, at high magnetic field here, we work at high magnetic field because we use fishback resonances. Um, that fishback resonance happens to be at 832 Gauss for lithium-6. Uh, and at that particular field, the relevant levels are these two here, which are the two lowest hyperfine states, um, and one excited uh, state here which, uh, to which we are going to send the atoms uh, when they absorb photons. Uh, these two here are separated by about 80 megahertz, and we are going to be dealing with uh, atoms that are uh, forming as an equal mixture between up and down here. So for fermions, we have 50% um, um, spin up, 50% spin down. I'm going to call this uh, up and down, but these are really uh, hyperfine states of, of lithium-6. So we have now these two uh, ground states instead of one, uh, and, and then again, we send light, and of course, we have about, uh, as I told you, half a million of these atoms uh, in the cavity. So when we do this uh, transmission spectroscopy experiment, um, um, okay, sorry, we, we have two control parameters, one here is this delta A, and what, what, the way we choose this is by choosing the cavity length. Once we choose the cavity length, that tells us which frequency uh, is sustained by the cavity mode. Um, and now we have chosen this frequency, and delta A is the difference between that frequency and the one of the transition between the atoms. Okay? So that's, um, that's chosen by fixing the cavity length, and once the cavity length is fixed, we send photons, uh, we, we drive the cavity with a laser, which frequency we change, and there's a detuning delta C here, which is the detuning between the empty cavity resonance um, and the laser, right? We, we're gonna sweep this frequency here and change this one as well, and that gives us this 2D map that you see here. This is delta C, this is delta A. So that looks rather complicated, but if you look at it first, um, if there wouldn't be any atom, what you would see is a transmission here, which is always located at zero, zero detuning, meaning delta C is zero here, we just send light to the cavity, it's resonant, um, and, and nothing happens. Now, if, you, if we were just to have only the atoms, but no cavity, what we would see is two absorption features, which would correspond to the two ground states uh, of my atom, and they would be, correspond to these lines here. That's where we would see absorption. And now when we put the two systems together, what we see is dressed states. Uh, you see branches here, uh, which, uh, which correspond to the, uh, uh, the, coupling, uh, the, the coupled uh, light matter excitations. We see one branch here, we should see here in between another branch, and the third one uh, down here, if we have just 
two ground state and one photonic mode. They mix uh, the three and we should get these three branches. So it looks much more complicated than that. Um, and the main reason is that the cavity is actually just not just single mode. So this is something we understand pretty well. That's a, a completely ab initio calculation just with what we know about the cavity that we can measure independently, putting the number of atoms we think we have inside the, the cavity and, and calculating the transmission spectrum. It's a classical calculation that, that you know, even I can do. Um, I, I, there's no adjustable parameters of any kind, and that's, that's what we expect. Um, the slight differences that we see here can, so can be explained by you know, slight misalignments between the position of the cloud and the, the center of the cavity and so on. So um, that simply shows that uh, indeed we achieved this uh, strong coupling regime. The cooperativity is pretty large. The dress state branches uh, are a manifestation of that. Um, of course, at that stage, that spectrum doesn't really care whether the atoms are interacting with each other, whether they are degenerate, bosons, fermions, or whatever. It just shows that we understand uh, the light matter coupling uh, pretty well in this, uh, in this situation. And if you look a bit carefully uh, here, you will see extra features which clearly do not appear in the simulation even at the qualitative level, and you see these lines here, for example. And these are things which I'm going to tell you about uh, in a minute, because this uh, is actually a manifestation of the strong light matter coupling, uh, of the uh, strong atom-atom uh, coupling, sorry. So, uh, okay, so le let's look in this spectrum more carefully and, and, and try to see whether it makes any difference uh, if the atoms are interacting or not. And to understand that, uh, you have to uh, imagine what happens when you have one ad not one atom interacting with light, but two. And when you have two atoms exposed to light, of course what can happen is that one of the atoms scatters the photon or the other scatters the photon. So that's um, sort of uh, back to the previous configuration. But what these two atoms can also do is that they can absorb the photon together and be turned into a molecule. Um, this process is called photoassociation. It's actually something that's well established in the, in the field of photorecord atoms. I, I, I mentioned here a review article on this topic. And the idea is that if the two atoms are close enough to each other, um, they, can be, they can be turned into an excited state molecule. That excited state molecule has a binding energy, right? And therefore, the optical resonance that you observe is actually uh, uh, shifted with respect to the, M, uh, to the uh, single atom resonance by an amount here. And that amount is simply the binding energy. So what you expect to see is that uh, the spectrum of the two, two, photon, two atom plus one photon problem should also have these extra resonances on the red side of the, of the, uh, of the, of the, of the single atom one. And now, uh, of course, if you put uh, now the cavity around and you, you have these photons interact with this particular resonance, the same game that I told you before is going to take place. That is, you can have coherent absorption and turning uh, pairs of fermions into molecules and back. And if that coupling is strong enough, um, well, you're going to have su coherent superpositions of photons and pairs. Now, let's look at the transmission spectrum of the, uh, of the cavity again. This is a close-up on these transmissions. You have this big here uh, uh, feature, which is just the coupling with one single atom uh, state that is here at zero. And if you follow that, you see these resonances all over the place. And these ones are actually these photo association resonances. And when you look carefully at these pictures, you see that for each of them, you have a nice anti-crossing pattern. So for each of these, we actually observe the strong coupling regime. Um, this was, um, to my knowledge, this is the first time that one gets coherent light matter interaction for these particular transitions. Um, this is something we call uh, pair polaritons because this is now coming from uh, the coupling of pairs with photons. And the really cool thing is that uh, actually, if, if you look at this resonance, it is something which depends on how likely it is to actually have two atoms close to each other in order to form a molecule. Now, whether or not you have two atoms close to each other, that depends on the structure of the ground state. If you change the way atoms are interacting with each other, um, it will be more or less likely. That's a two-body correlation function uh, of your gas. And uh, if you write down a simple model for, for light matter interaction, I just wrote the Hamiltonian here. Um, this is a simplistic version of the light matter interaction close to one of these photo association transition. Um, I think the details do not really matter, but, but um, um, you can uh, show that um, what you expect to see is a Rabi frequency, the square of the Rabi frequency, so the splitting between these lines here should be proportional indeed to the pair correlation function. So this pair correlation function is, 
integrated over all your cloud. Uh, there's a cavity mode function here, which is simply the standing wave we have inside the cavity. There are functions here, which are the molecular orbitals to which you're promoting your atoms. Um, and you have here the pair correlation function in the ground state of the system. Uh, so this photo association process has been actually studied in the past uh, uh, quite extensively, actually, for, for the, the strongly correlated Fermi gas. The very same um, concepts can be applied here uh, in this experiment. And what this means is that this splitting here should change when we change the way atoms are interacting with each other. And that's something we can do using the fishback resonance. Um, so I make the long story short. Um, so we change here the scattering lengths using the fishback resonance. And what we do is we measure the omega square, so this, uh, the square of the hub is splitting. What we do is we normalize by the value we have observed at unitarity. The reason for that is that there is a parameter here which depends on which molecular transition you're talking to. So this part, of course, is some molecular physics which we don't completely control, but what we know is that it more or less um, is constant when we change magnetic field. And therefore, by normalizing, we are left only with the variations of the pair correlation function itself. And indeed, for four different photo association transitions, when we measure this, this number, we find the same universal curve. And this universal curve is the pair correlation function of the ground state of the strongly interacting Fermi gas. Uh, and this is something which has actually been calculated, and it turns out that it's described uh, by TANS relations. Uh, it depends on one parameter, which is called the contact, so you probably uh, know much more about this in the, in the uh, uh, next uh, lectures by Jean. Uh, and there again, we took uh, one of the calculations, a Monte Carlo calculation of the contact that was published in this paper, and there's no free parameter. This is how our data look like. So what we have achieved with this is that uh, we look at the optical spectrum. We see Rabi splittings, which can be of um, tens of megahertz. So this is like two, three orders of magnitudes larger than the Fermi energy of the gas. Nevertheless, this Rabi frequency is directly the fingerprint of the pair correlations that we have in the ground state. There's another way to interpret this data, in particular the fact that it's the square which actually matters, is to uh, remember what it means uh, to have n particles instead of one. I told you that when we increase the number of uh, emitters in the cavity, we are actually increasing the, uh, uh, the cooperativity by an amount that's proportional to the number of atoms. So here what you just have to do is to count the number of pairs. And when you do that, so the contact uh, is actually a, a measurement of the number of pairs, and if you measure the Rabi frequency as a function of the number of pairs that you change by changing interactions, you see the square root scaling, which is, again, nothing but saying that the cooperativity scales was the number of emitters, but the number of emitters are now the pairs. Uh, and with this plot, you can give a rough estimate. So this is very rough, because we don't completely control the molecular physics. Uh, but what we see here is that um, the Rabi frequency for a single pair coupled to photon is of the order of the uh, uh, Rabi frequency for a single atom. And what this means is that pretty much everything we do with um, coupling atoms and photons, we can directly map it onto uh, coupling pairs uh, to photons uh, with the same experimental setup. So you can do cavity QED uh, with pairs now in the same way as we were doing, uh, doing it with, with individual atoms in the past. So. Um, this is uh, the first way by which uh, the uh, interactions can play uh, with, the, uh, with the light matter coupling. There's another way uh, which we have discovered last year, is that uh, you can also operate the system not uh, in the resonant regime, by which the photons are actually going to be scattered by the atoms, but in the dispersive regime. So what you do um, is you, you, you change the length of the cavity to the extent that the photons that are sustained by the cavity can no longer be scattered. And what you're left with is a refractive effect. So the atoms are just going to change slightly the index of refraction of the, uh, of the, uh, the medium. And therefore, uh, the cavity length is effectively changed. Um, this is the uh, Hamiltonian that describes that. And what you are going to get is second order processes by which the atom is only virtually being uh, excited. And this coupling has, a, as I said, an effect of changing the effective length of the cavity. So what's going to happen is that the frequency uh, of resonance is actually going to be slightly shifted. And it is shifted here by an amount which you can read from this Hamiltonian. It's simply the dispersive sheet per atom times the overlap of the density of the cloud with the cavity mode. The mode of the cavity is a standing wave, and therefore you have the cosine here. And using this, you can, for example, measure this dispersive shift and count how many atoms you have in your cavity. And that's something we have done uh, in the past. 
And the cool thing is that this is essentially non-destructive uh, because the, there's no real uh, scattering of photons. Of course, one should have a look at the details. It's not really Q and D, but um, in fact, when we actually take one cloud of fermions and we measure this by you know, sweeping over the cavity resonance, checking where light gets transmitted, turns out we can repeat this uh, typically 500 times over a single realization. So this is one uh, atomic cloud, which we have prepared here. And for five seconds, we measure 100 times per second where the dispersive shift actually is, and we can reconstruct this curve. Uh, this is one realization, and measuring now, and it's much more tedious, the temperature as we, uh, uh, um, as we perform this, this experiment. So we stop after some time, measure the temperature. We do this many times. Uh, we can see that the heating is actually very low. Uh, actually, we can do this for almost two seconds before the gas reaches um, the critical temperature by which it's not superfluid anymore. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, um, and it tells you also the kind of feature you get in the lab with the cavity that you get many, many, uh, uh, well, you get a lot of signal for a given realization of the experiment, which is really nice. Now, by the way, if you do it with pairs, you also have a dispersive shift that's due to coupling to photo association, and you can do the same thing. You can track um, the pair correlation function in time over a single cloud and, and show also that this is uh, very weakly destructive. That's something we have, uh, we have done as well. Um, together with the, the, the pair polariton uh, studies. Now, um, what I want to tell you now is that uh, you can study this and, and have a look at it and say, wait a minute, I mean, this is also an optical lattice which I imprint on my atoms, which strength is given by the number of photons inside the cavity. Uh, and, 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 you know, that, that's another way to interpret this, this, this Hamiltonian and, and in, such, in such a way that if I put a lot of photons in my cavity, I'm going to change the shape of the cloud and sure enough, um, some of the atoms will be shifted towards, uh, say, the antinode um, of the standing wave. And as they move from node to antinode, of course, the index of refraction is also changing. If all the atoms are located at the antinode, the shift is actually twice larger than if they are uniformly distributed. So as you send light in your cavity, you start to form this density modulation and uh, the, uh, uh, the location of the resonance moves. And this is just a cavity optomechanics experiment by which you have a collective motion of the atom, that's this density fluctuation mode, which is coupled uh, with the um, effective length of your cavity. <coughs> so this is something that was um, studied uh, quite extensively with both Einstein condensates, in particular in the group of, of Dan Stamper Kern over the last uh, 15 years. And what we are doing here now is, is we're just taking this strongly correlated Fermi gas and try to understand how this, this happens. Uh, and uh, you, what you should think is that we are going to start the measurement by setting the frequency of our probe laser somewhere here, and we just sweep across the resonance. And as we do that, there will be light will start to enter the cavity, and as light enters, the cloud gets modulated, and because it's modulated, the, 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 the length of the cavity is also changing. Uh, so, if you do it with increasing laser, uh, probe power, what you see is that for low power, you have a relatively nicely Lorentzian uh, transmission for your cavity. But if you do it with stronger and stronger power, you see this very strong distortion. And the distortion is due to the fact that the uh, cavity length is changing as a function of the power uh, that you have inside. Uh, this is something which uh, we can uh, measure in details. It's actually very difficult uh, to get uh, a quantitative uh, uh, agreement with a model for these kind of curves. There's only a small a limited window of parameters in which this actually works, and you can fit the entire curve that you see here, uh, including the wings, with a model which you can understand. Uh, and when you do that, uh, you can basically measure this particular parameter, which tells you how deep the density modulation is, as a result of a given strength of the optical lattice. And that's the density response function. <coughs> and this density response function is a many-body property. It depends how strongly the atoms are interacting with each other. So we do this, these experiments, and we measure this as a function of interaction strength. Uh, and, and we refer again, uh, we set to one here the parameter that quantifies the, the, the nonlinearity for the unitary Fermi gas. And that's the sort of the trend as we change the interaction strength. And now you can start to compare uh, with the uh, possible calculations of this density response function. So that was done for us by Shun Uchino from the uh, Japanese Atomic Energy Agency. And he did this uh, by uh, operator product expansion. Uh, that's mainly because the wave vector of light is larger than the Fermi wave vector. So one can do a sort of systematic expansion in this, 
uh, ratio. And that, that's the theory we get. Um, I should say that on, at least on the BEC side, it could, uh, at that stage, we, we don't completely control the theory here, uh, but the overall trend is, uh, I think, nicely reproduced. And what, what this theory tells us is that <clears throat> the reason why um, the nonlinearity is increasing uh, when interaction is going over unitarity is because of the change of the contact. So it's again the same parameter that controls the uh, pair correlations that is also entering this, uh, this result. Uh, and this is something which, uh, which one can directly see in the, in the experiment. Okay, so these are two different ways uh, by which one can get the signature on the optics of the strong interactions. But let, let's try to go one step further in the, in the last, say, uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, of this presentation. Um, so far, again, the atoms do what they want to do as a result of the well, strong correlations. We send light and we learn how they behave. Uh, but what we can do is, is change the way they behave using light, and, and we do that by inducing interactions using the cavity. Uh, how does this work? Uh, we have again, my, have again my two atoms. We work in the dispersive regime, but we now illuminate the atoms from the side and not on the axis of the cavity. And when we do that, um, say, this atom will be driven, and it can do some Rayleigh scattering. And if it does this Rayleigh scattering of light, it's very likely to be uh, uh, done in the cavity. Why? Because if the cooperativity is high enough, as soon as this atom is driven, it wants to scatter in the cavity. And once it does that, all the atoms that are in the cavity, they see this field that has been scattered by the first one. And they react accordingly. They get driven by this light. And if you think of this process now um, as a second order process, what you can get is that one photon is emitted here inside the cavity and rescattered by a second atom. Um, that happens typically uh, when, when the uh, uh, pump laser is detuned with respect to the cavity resonance such that you only virtually populate uh, the, the cavity and not effectively with, uh, with photons. It's very similar to uh, the, the dispersive scattering here. You never populate the excited state, but you get effectively a second order process. And this second order process you can write as an effective atom-atom interaction that's now mediated by light. So again, I mean, the, the, this process here is proportional to the, the strengths of the uh, dispersive coupling of atoms to the cavity. Alpha square here is the strength of this pump drive. So if I increase the power, I increase the, uh, the, uh, the, the strength of this interaction. And here I have a detuning, which is the detuning of the pump with respect to the cavity. And again, it's a second order process. It's like one over the detuning in the dipole force, for example. Uh, this also means that we can change the sign of this interaction by choosing whether we are head detuned or blue detuned with respect to the cavity. <coughs> the, the important thing is that this interaction has some um, spatial structure, and the space uh, dependence here um, is inherited from the shape of the pump beam and the shape of the cavity, uh, the cavity mode. GP here um, is the, the mode function of the pump. Usually it's a standing wave, so we have a standing wave, so basically two pumps one way and the, the other way around. Uh, and uh, GC here is the standing wave that is sustained by the, uh, by the cavity, so that, that's essentially the result of the, the boundary conditions, if you want, set by, by the cavity neurons. And that gives us an interaction that's uh, typically uniform over space. It's not actually uniform, but it's, but it's long range because it's as large as the cavity mode. Uh, that actually was discovered, I think, first in the group of Gerhard Remper in the, the, the early 2000s. And, and this is uh, now something which is heavily used in, in our community. Uh, there are many experiments one can do using these uh, uh, cavity-induced interaction. Historically, I think it started uh, with spin squeezing, which is the very same mechanism by which you can induce correlations between spin inside the cavity using a feedback mechanism mediated by, by, by the cavity field. And I just put it here, references uh, that are from last year, uh, because there are many, many uh, from the, the years before, and it's really a growing community uh, that's exploiting this for, for a lot of, of, of applications uh, that you can see here. In particular, uh, one has already seen uh, self-organized Fermi gases without interactions that was published uh, this summer. If you want to know more, there's a very nice and exhaustive review article by, by Helmut Rich and his uh, collaborators that, that gives the whole uh, picture on how to interpret these and, and what are the things that, that have been proposed and studied in the past. Okay, so now um, let's uh, look again at our uh, interacting gas. We now have, um, so I, I plot here the, the total interaction potential as a function of momentum, which you know now uh, very well. And um, 
if we have S-wave contact interaction, that, that's the flashback resonance, that's the Fermi gas we've produced, atoms colliding with a contact potential that's uh, somehow uniform uh, over momentum, at least up to certain values of K, I mean, afterwards it uh, holds down, as you, as you now know. And um, this is something we control using the flashback resonance, right? So we tune magnetic field around 832 Gauss. And what we know is that, and that we know this because, uh, you know, 20 years of studies in particular here at ENS have told us that the system is essentially becoming superfluid for low enough temperature as we take these fermions and cool them down in the vicinity of this resonance. And we can tune this interaction by changing the magnetic field. What we have on top of this is an interaction that's somehow the extreme opposite. Uh, that's the cavity-mediated interaction, which is comprising only of standing waves along different directions. So from the point of view of momentum structure, it's actually purely local. You have one particular wave vector here, and that's how the, the experiment looks like. We have the atoms here. We pump from the side with a certain wave vector P, and there's a, a cavity vector uh, Kc here. So there is one wave vector here, Kc minus Kp, uh, at which this interaction is going to play. We can change the strength and we can change the sign of this interaction. Uh, interestingly for us, uh, this uh, K minus, so the one with the minus sign here, there is Kc plus Kp, which is kind of very far away on that side for our geometry. Uh, if you have questions, I, I can comment a bit more on this. Uh, but, but this here is, is smaller than the Fermi wave vector. So, so if you look at it in momentum space, um, you start to, you send light this way that gets scattered here. So the atoms are going to get a recoil kick in this direction. Of course, we have retroreflected pump beams. The cavity is a standing wave, so the reverse process is also happening. So you're just get, getting K minus here, minus uh, K minus here. Um, and this is the, if this is the Fermi surface, now you have an interaction which couples these states with these ones. And again, this is local in momentum, so this is just a sort of discrete uh, set of points that get coupled to each other. And now, um, what is the uh, quantum state that, that you get if you have an interaction that is local in momentum? So if it's local in space, you get superfluidity. That, that's what we know. If it's local in momentum, you should get charge density wave. At least um, that's what a typical condensed matter physics is, is telling you. Uh, and indeed, so this is uh, now an experimental result. So we start to pump on that side. Uh, we have a, a lattice here. So this is supposed to be a lattice. Uh, it's actually a very, very short spacing, right? Uh, that's formed by just retroreflecting this beam. We increase the strength of this uh, pump beam here as a function of time, right? And we count the number of photons we have inside the cavity. And, and for some time, essentially, nothing happens. But as you reach a critical pump power, the system sort of forms spontaneously a density wave. And that density wave has exactly the right Bragg structure so as to scatter the photon from the pump in the cavity. So when it forms, you directly get the signature of this by a jump of the photon that you observe inside the cavity as a function of time. So this is the ramp of the power, essentially interaction strength, and for a critical interaction strength, this density wave uh, is forming. This is something that has been observed and heavily studied again over the last 10, uh, 15 years, in particular in the Esslinger group at ETH. We now have this for strongly interacting fermions as well. Um, with the geometry we have, uh, we have an interesting interplay with the Fermi wave vector because the, the, the momentum, the, the, the wavelength of this is actually larger uh, than the, uh, the Fermi wavelength. So, uh, and I just want to also advertise the cavity. That what's cool with the cavity is that you get a signal over a single realization. So this is one realization of the experiment uh, where you directly see the transition from, from uh, essentially uniform to uh, density wave. We can actually do uh, this study in a systematic way as a function of the different parameters. Uh, I'm probably not going to uh, comment much more on this. So these are phase diagrams uh, by which we change uh, the strengths of the pump power here and the tuning with respect to the cavity. So in principle, this transition line should be a line, right? Uh, which is simply you know, the dependence of the the, this long-range interaction onto the tuning, so that's something we can reconstruct. And we can do that uh, for different strengths of the uh, contact interaction uh, from BEC to BCS, so changing the magnetic field and reproducing these experiments. And we can keep track, say, of where this line actually is as a function of magnetic field, so this is here the flashback resonance, and we see um, how the density wave order plays um, against the uh, contact interaction. 
for all values of interaction strength or contact interaction, we see the density wave transition, there is a smooth decrease from the BEC side to the BCS side, which is not extremely surprising. After all, the BEC is a bit softer, it's more compressible, so it actually easily forms this, this pattern, a bit easier actually than the BCS side. This is still work in progress. Um, we would like to understand this a bit more quantitatively. We have a collaboration with the group of Helmut Rich. We are, we are trying to, to reproduce this uh, with, with, with uh, calculations with a certain degree of, of accuracy uh, that is, uh, that's going on. And the last thing I want to show is that uh, we can also observe direct signature of this interaction even before the self-organization actually takes place. After all, um, there is a, density, a susceptibility that is associated with the formation of this pattern. Again, similar to this optomechanics experiment I showed you before. And when this forms spontaneously, this just means that the system, without any external perturbation, just wants to do that kind of for free. So what we can do is we, we can measure this tendency of the system to form that particular density wave by sending the pump from the side and then um, basically seeding this using a small drive onto the cavity axis. We poke the system a little bit and we see whether or not it actually tends to form this uh, in an easy or hard way. And again, the signature we have is that if the system actually wants to form this density wave, if we uh, probe it very weakly, it's going to actually form it, and therefore a lot of light from the pump will be scattered in the cavity. So what we're going to see is that a very weak probe gets amplified by a lot, and this is something uh, uh, we have actually measured. So what we measure is the number of photons we get here uh, for a given strength uh, here of this drive, and that's again proportional to the susceptibility. Uh, and its susceptibility as a function of the power is seen to change. So if you have positive detunings, we see that it shoots up um, by an order of magnitude as we increase the power. It just means the system gets more and more soft up to the point, of course, where without any external disturbance, it just uh, spontaneously crystallizes. Uh, and the cool thing is that I told you we can choose the sign of this long-range interaction by changing um, the detuning. So if we do it with, uh, uh, with the opposite detuning, that's the blue points here, of course, there the system doesn't want to crystallize. It actually gets harder and harder, right? It gets stiffer and stiffer, if you want. But this is, this is something we see. Uh, we see a decrease of this susceptibility as we increase the pump power, simply because the system really does not want to do that. And what this means is that you, you send light here with your probe, and the system actually does not want to form this pattern in such a way that this light is actually scattered from the probe into the pump. So you have less light coming out than you send in. And, and I show you this because I think it also nicely illustrates the, the power of this, this cavity QED approach by which you can map the observables of your atomic system onto light. And that means that uh, you can very easily probe uh, things like the density wave susceptibility, uh, which otherwise would require very good uh, in-situ imaging. So this is work in progress. Uh, we have many, there are many things which we don't understand about this, this particular system that, that wants to self-organize. Um, we have to do a direct comparison with, uh, with theory, at least at the mean field level. This is something we should be able to do and see what, uh, what we get. We can measure frequency-dependent responses, uh, similar to Bragg spectroscopy. So we send pump and probe with a different frequency, and then we start to see how the system uh, gets excited or not. Um, everything is taking place in the cavity with some finite dissipation effects. So cooperativity is finite. And, and perhaps this has some consequences. This is something we also need to clarify. Um, and, and there are, of course, many directions over which we could go. And I just want to mention one, which is the fact that um, um, the competition between pairing and density wave order is something you find in a lot of strongly correlated materials, in particular high TC superconductors. Um, this is a review article which tries to draw all the possible consequences you can have when you have these competing orders between uh, um, sort of uh, spatial ordering and, and superfluidity. Um, I don't know yet how related our system is to this kind of problems. There is a huge amount of literature here, uh, but, but the hope is that uh, a few things uh, we can investigate are actually non-trivial from this uh, point of view as well. And, and last thing I, I want to say is that uh, so here I showed you we have these two extreme interactions, one which is purely local, one which is purely long range. It would be really interesting to be able to interpolate in between. 
Uh, and we have ideas on how to do that, uh, to basically be able to program the way the system uh, interacts with each other. I'm not going to say much more, but this is the topic of this new experiment uh, um, that, that is being built also in, in, in my group, where we think we, we can control to some extent, uh, essentially uh, get out of this uh, uh, situation in which a long-range interaction is imposed by the mode function, but have something in which we can control locally uh, which atom interacts with, uh, with which. This is, uh, this is also work in progress in the group. So uh, that's the, the summary of, of what I've been telling you about. We've coupled strongly interacting fermions to light uh, in a high finesse cavity. There are a few surprises you get when you do that just by observing what you get in transmission spectroscopy. Um, and, and we are now able to use this uh, to induce new types of order in the cavity. And that, that is uh, work which is going on uh, at the moment. So with that, uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you.